Thank you so much. I am so glad that you're here today. And um, I want to share this morning a little of my story and how and why I'm in the fight to help women and to reach women who are both trafficked or trapped in the sex industry businesses. It all started 13 years ago. The Lord radically changed my life. My family and I had been missionaries in East Africa for 10 years. I'm still a full-time missionary with One Mission Society. And uh, we came home and I started teaching missions classes at a little Bible college. And my husband started leading a ministry as well in the States. And we'd been home about two years and I was having quiet time with the Lord one morning and he took me to 2 Peter 1.19. And a phrase in that verse says, be as a light that shines in a dark place. And I knew he was speaking to me, but I had no idea what form that would take. And then a few weeks later, I was helping to take some young people on a trip and we were going down the interstate, interstate in a bus and coming toward us was a billboard advertising a strip club. And there was a girl on there in fringes and high stiletto boots and her picture just broke my heart and I bowed my head and I prayed quietly oh God please send someone to help those poor young women I bet you know what happened <laughs> be careful what you pray for <laughs> I heard the Lord speak to me in his still small voice and he said I found someone it's you <laughs> And I think my stomach kind of dropped. And then when I recovered a little bit, I said, well, Lord, you know, I've promised that I'll witness to anybody you bring across my path. And he spoke again. And he said, no, I want you to go where they are. And it was very clear. And at first I took it right back to my Bible college students and I spoke in a chapel and I said, here's what I feel like the Lord has said to me. Would any of you help me? Would any of you go with me? And boy, I mean two dozen uh, on fire Bible college students jumped on board and we started going to the streets and the street corners and the alleyways and to the strip clubs and wherever the girls were. There's about 4,000 strip clubs nationwide and we would just meet to pray and then divide up into teams and head out into these places of darkness. They're all dressed up, so many of them, in neon lights. A lot of them are painted pinks and purples. They have names like fantasy girls and babes. One I saw was called the ultimate place to be. What a mirage. What a lie of the devil. As we got to know the girls and heard their stories of abuse and terror, of hopelessness and despair, our hearts broke again and again. I'll never forget the first little trafficked girl that I met. They all have a stage name in the clubs and her name was Kitten. And every week I would be reaching out to Kitten one day she came to the club and her leg was in a cast all the way up to mid thigh. And I said, oh, kitten, what happened to your leg? And she just dropped her head and wouldn't tell me. But her girlfriend standing next to her said, oh, Big Mo. And that was the first time I realized Big Mo was her owner. She said, oh, Big Mo heard she was thinking about running. So he put her leg over a kitchen chair and stomped it slavery right in our own backyard. I'm so glad God had a team of Christian ladies there that night to tell her she could get, that we could get her to a place of safety away from Big Mo. I'll never forget another night, a girl telling me, Miss Carolyn, sometimes I wake up at night and I just feel so dirty. I just feel so filthy. I hate my life. I hate what I have to do day in and day out with men, with women. 
She said, sometimes I wake up in the night and I just start to claw my skin. I claw my thighs, the inside of my thighs until they almost bleed. I get up and I take a hot, hot shower. I turn on the hot water just as hot as it'll go until it's burning me. But then when I lay back down in my bed, I still feel the same. I just still feel so dirty. And she said, Miss Carolyn, is there any way do you think I, someone like me, could ever feel clean? I'm so glad God had a team of Christian ladies there that night to say, oh yes, honey, you never have to feel that way again because the blood of Jesus was shed for you to wash you whiter than snow. You can have a new life in him. I'll never forget another girl telling me in a dressing room one night, all I am is a dog. I'm just a stray dog. I wrapped her in a hug and I said, don't ever call yourself that. Why would you say that? She said, nobody has ever loved me. She said, first, my parents didn't love me. They loved drugs more than me. When I was six, I got picked up by CPS and my whole life was just being trucked to one foster family after another family. Nobody ever wanted me. All I am is a stray dog that people just kick to the curb. I'm so glad God had a team of Christian ladies in that club that night to wrap her in hugs and say, you are loved. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Don't ever think of yourself that way again. It started just on that Bible college campus, but today we have a couple of dozen uh, teams of Christian women across America going in to these places of darkness, and God is using us to share the love of the Lord with these broken and wounded girls who need to hear it so much, so desperately. From the very beginning, we saw two things, two things happening. We saw God's power to protect us, and we saw God's power to save, to be able to penetrate that darkness. And our God is a mighty saving God. He can turn lives around. Do you agree with that? We say amen. I remember we, when we were with the, just starting on that campus, sometimes there would be owners that would be upset with us for being out around their clubs or coming in and sometimes would threaten us. And one owner began to say, we, we, this team would just stand on the streets, but they were in front of his club and he didn't like it. And he started coming out and saying, if you come back again, I'm going to sick a guard dog on you. But, of course, we kept going back. Well, one night, I wasn't on this team. I was at another club, but I had a team of three young people all preparing to be missionaries. And they were there to witness on that street. And he came out and he said, you came back again? And the students said, yes, sir. We're in the South. They're polite. <laughs> and he said, well, tonight I brought the dog. And he marched across a long parking lot opened up his truck door and out jumped a big white German shepherd. And he said, get him. And that dog came running full force across the parking lot to that team. And they, I said to him later, what did you do? They said, well, we were so afraid. We couldn't move. We were just frozen. And we were just praying quietly, God help us, God help us, God help us. I'm here to tell you today, when that dog got from about me to Margo here on the second row, about eight feet away, the dog suddenly just stopped, sat down on his haunches, tilted his head, and would not attack. <laughs> now here's, <laughs> yes, you can clap. Here's what I think happened. Do you remember that story in the Old Testament about Balaam and his donkey? And God opened that donkey's eyes and let him see a beautiful angel blocking the way. Well, I believe with all my heart that God opened that dog's eyes and let him see a beautiful angel that was in front of that little team of future missionaries who are all serving the Lord today. <laughs> 
and we saw God's power to save. We saw girls getting saved, getting their lives turned around. We saw customers getting saved and still do. Sometimes men would be on their way in. They're encountered with a Christian witness and they end up kneeling down on those parking lots and on those street corners and they're praying through to salvation. We've seen a bouncer get saved. We've seen a security guard get saved. We've seen three members of an organized crime family that ran a string of clubs from Jackson, Mississippi to Memphis, Tennessee get saved. Our God is mighty. Those early students got so excited, they hung a sign in the student center and it said, Strip clubs are the Friday night place to be for Wesley College students. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I got in a little trouble over that sign. <laughs> Administration, visiting parents. But I never said a word about that to the students because there was no way I wanted to dampen their fire. You know what? I think that we've been doing this faithfully for about four years or so seeing God doing exciting things, and I think we may have attracted the enemy's attention. You know, when things are going real well, he feels like he's got to attack. I think we got on his radar. And I want to tell you, he came at me like a ton of bricks, and I always say to ladies that join up to be on these outreach teams, you better get ready because you will get involved immediately in spiritual warfare. He came at me from every direction. First, my doctor, I started feeling tired, and my doctor said, well, I'm sorry. Your blood is turning into a tenacious, fast-acting form of leukemia, and you need an emergency bone marrow transplant just as fast as you can get one to have any hope at all. And so I began to be in a fight for my life. In the midst of that fight, I was standing in our bedroom one day, emaciated, and my husband came in and looked at me and said coldly, I don't really love you anymore. And that was like a grenade going off in my chest. And he left me when I needed him the most. Then soon, right after that, the little Bible college where I was teaching full time said, I'm so sorry, but... We can't hold on anymore. We've got to close our doors. So I lost my full-time job. Then I was still too weak to work. Bills were piling up. My home went into foreclosure. I ended up losing my home. And then my husband, who had always been a very domineering person, began to send me messages saying, I will have control of the children. We still had two teenagers at home. He said, I will have control of the kids. I will say whatever it takes. I will lie. I will do whatever, but I will turn them against you. I will make it so they don't even want to have anything to do with you. And one night the kids had went on a weekend visit, but they ended up leaving with him. And he took them to another state. And for months, I couldn't even find them. I had to hire private investigators. Now, all this happened from the time I had my bone marrow transplant to the time the kids left in the night was only 18 months. I'd last health, husband, home, job, and now kids. My whole world, I felt like, was gone. But I want to tell you one thing. In those darkest days of my life, Jesus never left me. And I would hear him whispering to me, you are my daughter. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But I was in terrible grief, such depression that I was nearly lethargic. And my dad's a godly, wonderful Methodist minister. He came and found me in the state I was, and he said, Carolyn, let me take care of you for a while. Come back to the family farm. And we're going to pray, and we're going to walk those fields, and we're going to seek God's face because I know he's not finished with you, Carolyn. Don't give up. And I'm so thankful for a godly dad that did that for me. And so here I am at age 46, going back to the family farm, broken in every way. 
My dad started taking me to see a Christian psychologist, and he immediately put me on heavy doses of antidepressants to try to help me get up to a normal level of functioning again. But there was so much grief and loss to work through. I wasn't making much progress. I think I'd been with dad about six months when I heard about a ladies' Christian conference that was coming near my town. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me again, and he told me to go. I didn't want to go to that. I didn't want to get dressed up. I didn't know anybody that went to that church. But I know his voice, and so I obeyed. Well, there was a dynamic little lady evangelist from South Korea at that conference, and she gave a powerful message, and she said, if you have needs and problems, come forward and let's pray. And I went forward, and lots of ladies went forward. And she started coming down the row, laying hands on people and praying for them. And when she touched my shoulder, she said, oh, and stepped back. And I looked up at her, and she said, you are filled with such pain and sorrow. You are carrying such suffering and grief. And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, well, the Lord has given me a message for you tonight. He is saying that a doctor won't fix this and pills can't solve this. But the Lord is saying, I, the Lord, will deliver you, my daughter, from depression. And I'm telling you, friends, when she rang that out with authority over me, it felt like a pitcher of warm water poured over me. And the joy of the Lord flooded back into me. And I knew I was healed and delivered. And I went home that night and I said, Dad, I'm okay. I know I can do ministry again. And what I want to do is reach those girls again. And from that night forward, I've been going strong ever since. Speaking and training and going city to city wherever a door opens to say to Christian ladies, we need to form an army. We need to form teams. Here to your team here, a team there. These girls are reachable. They need to know that God loves them. Will you join me? Will you be a part and reach these broken, hurting women? There's three ways you could be a part of Light and Darkness Ministry. And I have uh, sheets, sign-up sheets at my display. One is to be on an outreach team. And if you're willing to join, I think right now we have about six teams working in the Indianapolis area. I'll take you through a two-hour training workshop, and we'll help you get connected to a team. It's not hard. I say it's just hanging out and loving people and making friends, and you can do that. And then I need prayer warriors because, like I said, it's spiritual warfare out there. And I need women and men who will commit to pray, commit to pray that we'll have divine appointments, that God will give us help and boldness in sharing his love, and pray for protection over the teams. If you're willing to be an intercessor, sign up on that sheet, give us your email, and you'll start getting a, a one, once a week an email from a team telling you an update and how to pray. And then it's all about loving these girls into the kingdom. If you'd like to be on a project team for six of the major holidays, we take in a gift to every girl working in every club where we're doing ministry so that every girl gets a Christmas gift, every girl gets a Valentine's gift, etc. If you'd be willing to help put together gift bags or do other practical things, we help in practical ways sometimes with tutoring, filling out job applications, all kinds of things. Sign up on that project, and I'll correspond with you and tell you ways that you could help. In closing, I'll just say one night I was, you know, we make friends with every person in the clubs, from the cover charge guy, the bouncer, the bartender, as well as everybody in there. And I had made friends with a bartender named Candy, and I was saying goodbye to her one night, and I said, Hey, Candy, we're getting ready to head out. But I just wanted to thank you for letting us be in here tonight and talk to the girls. And she said, oh, well, I think it's cool 
what I don't understand is, why haven't you church ladies been here long before now? Don't you know these places are full of hurting and messed up girls? Man, that was like a slap in the face. Here's a non-Christian, a non-believer saying, where has the church been? Don't you know? This is a place where they are, folks. And I'm trying to build an army one woman at a time to get to them. I'd love for you to join me. When our country was in the Civil War, sometimes a Union soldier would ride. If a battle was nearby, he would ride into a town. He would run to the church. He would start ringing the bell, which was an alarm. All the townspeople would gather. And he'd say, the battle is near, and I need every able-bodied man to come and help and join the fight. Well, I want to be for you like that Union soldier tonight. I've come to this church. I'm ringing an alarm bell. I am saying the battle is near, even at our very doorsteps. And I'm calling, will you help join the fight?